Welcome to the Mini Break, your daily podcast for the biggest storylines, results, and controversies from the tennis world. Today is Friday, January 21st. Now, I know what some of you listeners are thinking as you look at your Mini Break podcast feed. On day five of the Australian Open, Alex, you're going to abandon us and focus on something that isn't the actioning happen, action happening, excuse me, down in Melbourne. No, 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 no. Rest assured, listeners, we can multitask here at Crack Rackets. It's going to be a two Mini Break Friday. We're going to focus on all the action happening at the 2022 Australian Open on a separate podcast breakdown all of the day's biggest matches preview the next day's action as well. But of course, as all of you listeners are well aware of, there's always so much happening across levels in the tennis world. The Challenger Tour, the ITF Tours happening year round, of course, junior action heating up across the globe as well. But a level of tennis that will always be near and dear and dare I say central to our hearts here at Crack Rackets is what's happening in the college tennis universe. And of course, for all all of us college tennis fans, yes, the ITA kickoff weekend still a week away, but we know the action, it's already begun. And we've talked about some of it on our Crack Rackets podcast, whether it be the men's matches down in Texas last weekend, TCU, Tennessee, TCU, Florida, Florida versus Texas, of course, on the women's side, you had the Michigan Invitational, the action in NC State, Oklahoma taking on Princeton as well. Plenty of fun for us to have already enjoyed, but the action really does heat up this weekend. Plenty of college tennis teams competing for either the first time or early in this college tennis season. We've got top 25 matchups. We've got Power 5 conference foes taking on one another. It should be a fantastic week of college tennis. And to help all of you fans sift through all the action, know what sites should I be watching? What storylines should I be monitoring throughout the course of the weekend's action? Where should I be focused before that play in Melbourne begins each and every night? We decided to discuss it on today's podcast. And if you are going to discuss college tennis, there are only so many people you'd want to bring on a podcast. I have two of those people joining me on the show here today. Let's start with by far the better of our two guests. Of course, you know him as your co-favorite writer for our website, CrackedRackets.com, founder of the No Ad No Problem blog, at J Tweets Tennis on Twitter, our friend John J. Parsons. J, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, Gruskin. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is an exciting permutation of the Holy Trinity adjacent uh, that I'm joining here today. So excited to talk about the action, real results, real matches coming up. Um, lots to discuss. Yeah, look, it's not disrespectful to Maddie. I murdered him. It was just time for him to go. We had reached a parting of ways. You listeners will hear our Tennessee podcast. <laughs> Things got particularly heated. Chris is laughing as I say that because he was on it. Maddie and I were vehemently disagreeing on the Tennessee podcast, and so I had to murder him. I'm sorry. No, of course, just Maddie uh, busy with some real world things and so unfortunately couldn't join us tonight. It would have been a four person podcast if he could because I do want to mix things up. But now, you know, all right. A little sneak behind the glass here, listeners. This is our second intro we recorded. My microphone started freaking out during the first one. In the first one, Jay made a fantastic joke about the permutations. Chris said, well, what about the permutation without you, Alex? To which I said, well, you wouldn't be hosting, Chris. It would absolutely be Jay. Let me just say that punchline killed in the moment. So, you know, got to work it in there subtly. But you heard him giggling, the king of giggles. And, of course, the man whose website is now officially up and and running website uh, west off Q that applause please of course you know him best as the forefather of the college tennis ranks formula predictions never far from the listed UTR one of the many dames to root for the five star getting Liberty Flames lover of almond joys lover of mothers the snitch the professor he quotes Henry Ford he has one shoulder UTR under five college baseball in the books post prime Greg Maddox it's our friend Chris Hallioris Chris hey great shot even though it's a mini break podcast, I just, it's part of the routine when I see you. How are you doing, my friend? I, yeah, I feel like that's like half the mini break right there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be allowed on the mini breaks anymore if you keep making the intro longer. 
<laughs> well, you know, the good news is it's a mini break in title only. I think our listeners have learned that fact pretty quickly. You know, again, we'll go behind the glass twice here early, a couple of tangents. This is why we don't invite Chris on the show. Uh, but you, we called it the mini break because it was our first. We were going to go daily and B. It was supposed to be like, all right, let's talk about all the day's news in 10 to 20 minutes. And you just realize, well, there's 17 events happening. And what are you going to do one minute and be like, winners, Uchiyama, like Daniel, Vesely, Kasmanovich, next tournament, go. And it's like, that doesn't work. And so it's still the mini break, of course. And every time I hear a commentator say that he's up a mini break, I'm like, are you going to cite me? Are you going to at least plug the pod? Like, come on, it's low hanging fruit. They yeah, never you do. You trademark that. Yeah. You coined it, huh? Yeah. I, I just got to get one of them on the show frequently enough to be like, huh. And you know, whenever I think mini break, I think Alex Gruskin because synonymous with the brand. Um, but anyways, all of that said, Chris Halioris, hello, my friend. How are you doing? I am doing great, Alex. Uh, you know, obviously, as you had mentioned, the site's back up and that's what's keeping me busy, uh, you know, in addition to a, a real job and everything else going on in life. But uh, yeah, what a what a time. Start of the college tennis season, uh, you know, first couple of weekends. It's, it's a good time. Yeah. And you had a nephew who was my age, so you're probably tangentially aware of the reference I'm about to make. But Jay, you can attest to this. Chris switching his hat from forwards to backwards at the start of this podcast. Very Ash Ketchum pokemon -y. Like, that's a very, you know, Ash move there from Hallie Oris. And I have to say, again, with the flow you've got, it's, I'm not saying you don't pull it off, but I, I, you are ready for business. I, always, always. <laughs> and I was going to make the, the, the tennis appropriate. It felt like the Serena business bun. We felt like yeah. that backwards hat came on and we were oh, down to come business on. here. Yeah. A any, any analogies between the two of us and I'm out. Come on. Are you no. kidding? He's the starting right fielder for the Astros with that hair. A, because it flows out the back. B, because he's a cheater. And so he'd be a perfect <laughs> Astro. Uh, but no, um, with all of that said, and I do want to give you props and we had West off cue the applause you don't have to tell me about the efforts, but on behalf of all of us, and I want to give you the platform here for what we can expect, uh, you know, myself, Jay, Maddie, coaches, players, anyone who's bothered you, me, all of us to ask you to get it up as the season starts. Thank you for all you do at College Tennis Ranks, having that week ahead schedule. I know the week behind will get going as there are more matches accumulating as well. What can we now see that the site's up and running, Chris? What do you have for all of us? And just let us know where to go as well, please. Yeah, I mean, collegetennisranks.com, obviously. And, uh, and and that's by far the biggest hit on, on the site that I get, uh, especially early in the season, the week ahead page. Everybody goes there for a consolidated view. There is no good place out there for a consolidated view. The best news that I've got for you is, you know, I, I got it up. Uh, we've now, since it's been up, I've added the times. Uh, you can now get back to sorting by times on, on the schedules. The best news is, it has historically been limited to what schools have entered and put with the ITA. We are now going to have, I mean, we're getting the information directly from the schools. We're, we're going to, within the next week, you will see what is, you know, there are a lot of programs. I don't know why it's West seems to be West coast bias. Maybe that's just me because I'm East coast bias, but they never get the dang schedules in there. So we're always missing them. I don't want to hear you, Adam Schachterly. My <laughs> schedules aren't in there. And I have to tell you, we'll get your SID to put them in. Well, I'm not going to have to say that anymore because we're just, we're you know, now we're getting them from you. So, uh, so very, very, very shortly, we will have the schedules, whether they're registered with the ITA or not. Uh, and it'll be one good consolidated place to be able to look for all schedules across the board. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that, uh, that you know, that, that's an enhancement over previous years. Other than that, yeah, everything's back up and running. And uh, and I appreciate all the messages from the coaches, the, uh, you know, the fans, the Gruskins, everybody hit me up. You know, I could, yeah. I've probably got, you know, 30, 40 messages in the last week. Hey, are you ever going to get the week ahead back running again? Uh, and so, yeah, it was time and, and, it, and it's up and going. Two things off of that. A, I always say something pretty mean in the first text. I was like, where's the website? And then I said, please. I was like, but please, like, come on. Um, B, I'm actually devastated in terms of missed joke opportunities. How did I not put in the intro? He finally got it up. 
Like, that yeah, was just I'm- low-hanging fruit there for me, which just like your low-hanging fruit now. Uh, and I just didn't take it, and I didn't take it, and I'm just devastated. I mean, usually it takes pills the color of the shirt you're wearing. But, <laughs> or your headphones or anybody, whatever. Yeah, you know. that's good. Shout out the color blue. All right. With all that said, Jay, you looked like you had something to add to that as well. Oh, I mean, I just wanted to say, it's, Chris, it's incredible that the website's back up. I think the addition of pulling from the school sites will be more valuable this year than ever before with the amount of cancellations and changes that we're starting to see. I just, it's unrealistic to expect these SIDs or coaches to go in and be constantly updating. That's like a one and done thing you want to do. Those websites, however, are getting updated. And so the information being pulled there is chef's kiss. Like that will be so beneficial. So thank you for, for doing that. And I appreciate you pointing out that detail because to listeners who want to know why do we call him the professor, that's why. That detail that he finds to make it that much more efficient for all of us. Sincerely, again, Tacos Jay Sentiment. I know I speak for everyone listening right now. Thank you for what you do. CollegeTennisRanks.com. All words, all fully spelled out. CollegeTennisRanks.com. That's the place to go to use all of Chris's, uh, what's the accessories to the website. Uh, with all of that said, a couple of things we want to talk about as we frame this weekend. Let's start with the latest edition of the ITA coaches pull. And, you know, they have the added benefit now of a couple of matches in play. And I want to start on the men's side because obviously we had more prominent results as it relates to the top of those rankings over the course of last weekend. I think deservedly so for Tennessee. And we talked about it on a couple of shows. You know, it's going to be on the number one uh, college contenders episode for the women. For Pepperdine, it's going to be on the number two for the men. But for Tennessee to go in without Vic now, without Prada, uh, and go knock off uh, TCU on the road coming off of a win over Florida, 4-3. They dropped the doubles point in that match as well. Still win the match. They've earned that number one ranking. Now, it is worth noting, 12 voters, it seems like, in this coaches poll. Eight vote for Tennessee. Two still for Florida, two for Baylor. You look right now, Baylor number two in the country. They have Florida and TCU tied for three. Of course, Florida stays up there on the back of that win over Texas, who moves to five. Ohio State six, Virginia now tied with Georgia at seven, USC nine, Wake Forest 10. Of course, they were nine and 10 in the original poll of this 2022 calendar year as well. Not too much movement. I don't know if there was any movement actually near the bottom of these rankings in this poll. Start with you, Chris. You're the rankings guru. Your reaction to this, uh, the the changes at the top of the men's rankings. I, I mean, look, I don't want to go on too terribly big a rant, <laughs> but I mean, you know, hey, I don't. This is the first full pod I've done with Jay. It's got to be a little bit spicy, and right? You weren't. I, I feel bad because again, go listen to the Tennessee pod. It was a good one. It was a lot of me and Matt. Like it was a yeah. lot. I told Chris at the end. I was like, hey, man. I'm sorry. I was like, I think I feel like we didn't let you talk enough. Like, I, that's my bad. I, that was a bad hosting job. I mean, I was a little bleep blocked in there, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, look, let's be honest. And I would tell every single one of the coaches that voted inappropriately, as I will call it, you screwed up. OK, I know it's not your job. Come on, I'm the SEC guy, I'm SEC biased, and in no way, shape, or form after week one, can you possibly vote Florida in front of TCU? It's just not possible. For all of you coaches that did it, you screwed up, go back and redo your ballots, whatever. Uh, You know, I know there's 12 of you, I'm not going to call you out by name, go look (laughs) it up on the ITA site if you're that inclined, but but yeah, you it's just it's it's poor poor job by you, sorry, but TCU deserves to be ahead of Florida for beating them uh, after this week. Yes, they lost to Tennessee. Okay, so what? You put Tennessee in front of TCU, but you put TCU in Florida. Not that hard. Now figure out where you slide Texas and and Baylor in. Texas lost to Florida, Texas goes behind Florida. The only question is where do you slide Baylor in? I don't understand what the difficulty was, how we end up with Florida tied with TCU and Florida still getting two first place votes. I mean, unless it's Brian Shelton and I'll tell Brian to his face, I love him. Love you, Brian. But if you voted yourself number one, but he's not even in the voting poll, so it doesn't matter. But uh, it's ridiculous. That's not possible. So uh, beyond that, yeah, I mean, it's it's directionally, it's directionally correct. Obviously, it's got a few discrepancies with what we vote. 
Uh, but, you know, it's not uh, beyond the, the Florida TCU discrepancy after that. Uh, not any not any monstrous issues, if you will, other than we're still really underselling Stanford as a coach's poll. I mean, that their Stanford is way, way, way too low. We as a as a cracked rackets group have voted Arizona higher based off what they did last year. But I can see I can see the argument for still putting them down at, at 14 uh, in the coach if you want to. I mean, you look at them on paper, the players maybe as individuals don't add up as, you know, they're they're in the right area in the coaches poll for based on on the players resumes if you will but i think that as a team they they're just really really good uh but other than that yeah i think it's it's directionally correct i just have you know a big beef with the whole still getting floored up where they are jay i want to give you the floor i'm about to throw like seven different takes at you your way and by the way feel free to continue to chime in on the florida uh at number three and getting to first place votes topics a couple of things you would also i'm sure (laughs) want to chime in on wake forest we know there's no squire for them now they're still at number 10 north carolina i think we can say pretty sure no rinky he's still competing i know he's playing doubles today down at the australian open I mean, if he does come back, sure. Like then at 13, it makes more sense. But to have North Carolina there for now, curious your thoughts on that. Would I have punished my Wolverines after that match against Virginia Tech? Maybe. Like they probably moved down my poll when I submit to the USTA poll when it starts at the beginning of February, barring them having a really nice kickoff weekend against Wake Forest. But I mean, so just to add to the number, because that is the big takeaway, obviously, Florida getting two first place votes. Again, 12 votes couple of things. A, to the two people who watched this weekend's action and were like, yeah, but I still lean Baylor. Shout out to them. Because, like, that's confidence in your convictions. And I have no problem disagreeing with someone who has the confidence in their convictions. You can uh, be amenable and disagree. Shout out to those two who are like, eh, I still got Baylor. Uh, But, like— They switched to Baylor, though. Yeah. They they had Florida unanimous last two weeks ago. They watched the weekend and goes, you know what? It's Baylor. That's what I'm saying. That's just like delightful. Just mwah. that to me. Shout out to those two. You're the real winners. Um, yeah, to the two people who voted Florida. I mean, Matt Sikowiak, again, on this now infamous Tennessee podcast, made the case that he actually feels better about this Florida team with these results coming out of him than he did heading into the season. And part of that's a byproduct of what he thought about Tennessee. But part of that's also a byproduct of the fact that, you know, again, Riffis, Shelton, and Vale go two and four on the weekend, and the team manages to go one and one. That likely won't be the case in May. They lose doubles in the first point, win it in the second match. Hopefully, that's a sign of a trend from last season to this season moving forward. It was a 4 3 loss to TCU. Like, it's not as though it was an atrocious loss. But it is bold. Like, Tennessee, I don't know how you don't get It's not the vote for Florida, it's how do you not vote for Tennessee, Jay? Yeah, I mean, I think this, the question is, is this about like potential or is this about like the results that we're seeing? Preseason poll is potential. We now have results. And I think you need to judge based on the results that you see. Do you maybe still feel good about Florida as winning in May or being a top team? Yeah, sure. Great. Uh, Are they ranked ahead of TCU? No. Right. And until they both have a body of work where that head to head becomes less relevant, like these sort of things should matter more early in the season than maybe later on. And so I echo Chris's sentiment for that not to be taken into account for coaches to, to still leave Florida as number one to, <laughs> to to pivot and go, I can't choose. So I'm choosing Baylor. Um, I, I think it's I think it's silly. Um, and then the one other thing I'll add, because um, I think you guys brought up most of the other rankings is uh, UCF got clobbered by Georgia. And so they did move down in the rankings. So there was like some sign of life um, from this poll to say like, OK, there's a recognition that maybe they were a little high, I think at 11 or 12. And now they're down to 14. But um, that was the other like reaction to a result that I thought was warranted and did actually reflect itself in this ranking. 14 probably still feels a little high. No, I'm glad you pointed that out. And on the flip side of that would be Georgia tied for seventh with Virginia. 
there's a lot of Georgia love. And I know talking to coaches and people around college tennis, I mean, that team's got a nice blend, right, of people coming in and Ethan Quinn comes in this semester as well to add to the talent they bring back and to add to the additions of McCormick and Hamish Stewart as well. It's a deep Georgia team. Like, they they are good. Quinn is redshirting, though. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, wow. I have several sources to confirm. Several source several confirmed. Several sources. Jay, Maddie, when's the last time you several source confirmed? <laughs> um, come on, take notes. Um, no, I like it. That's that's fascinating. Yep. Um, all right, interesting. Still very good Georgia team though. Still a uh, very oh, absolutely. Yeah. By the way, that just might have put them over the top. Um, right. but no, it's again. I want to see USC play more Sherwood Cup. Whatever. I thought Geller playing for the first time in a very long time looked fine for Stanford. I I stand by my – I think Geller's going to play like three or four in that lineup for Stanford. I don't want to make my several court source confirmation, but like it would not shock me to see it go Fairy Bride 1-2 to start the year. But I, again, I, I guess final thoughts go to you, Chris, on this – oh, to both of you. We'll start with you, though, Chris, on this men's poll. Yeah, I mean I, I don't necessarily – I'm – I don't like calling out the, uh, you know, the late eggs, if you will, but UCF certainly, and they were, they were overranked to start, uh, you know, primarily based off what they did last year, but look, you know, you get, you get your, you're down, you're down to camps going pro you're down to Mizuchi transferring to Baylor. You bring in Cronje from, from VCU, you lost in that transition. Um, you're going to drop. So, it's a, I, they're still a good team. I I'm with Jay. I think they're a little overrated at 14. The, they're, they're going to need to, they, they will drop a little bit. Um, and you know, unfortunately for them, they run into Florida this weekend uh, that well, I'm sure we'll talk about, but, uh, but yeah, that's a, that, that's a, it's going to be maybe a little bit, a little rougher go than they'd like to see uh, at, at UCF. But, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, Georgia, Georgia, definitely, definitely. I know uh, between the three of us, b- between you, Maddie and I, that did the previews for the men's side, you and I were both a little lower on Georgia. I know I can speak for myself being primarily from the fact that I just hadn't seen from the two transfers, right? Between Stewart and, and, and McCormick, I hadn't seen anything in the fall that got me really excited. I was really excited knowing they were transferring, but then when I saw their play, I wasn't super excited about what they had done to think, wow, you lose, you are, you lose zinc to Oklahoma state, but uh, you know, you're going to be able to bring these two guys in and that's going to actually going to be minus one plus two. And you end up net positive out of it. I didn't feel that way after seeing what they did in the fall, but seeing kind of what they've done early in this spring season, they've both looked really good. And if they continue down that path, yeah, I think Georgia is actually probably right now a better team than they were last year. And they're definitely a solid top 10 team. And I didn't have them in the top 10 preseason. So, so things looking up for them. Yeah. For the record, you are more than welcome to speak for me. That's fine. Um, But yeah, I mean, I would have rigged it and just made NC State and Princeton 24 and 25 so I could say, look, it's a top 25 matchup this week. Um, <laughs> but, you know, other than little things like that, uh, Jay, any final thoughts on the men's side before we move to the women? Nope, let's move to the women. All right, let's then get you start first, Jay. Give me your first take on the on the women's side. Um, all right, well, much like, ba- much like the Baylor on the men's side, I'd love to know the voters who had three votes on Pepperdine two weeks ago and decided to move those votes <laughs> yeah. off of Pepperdine <laughs> to Texas. Um, one of the big questions with Texas is how good are their freshmen? And none of them played <laughs> at the hidden duel in Miami. Uh, meanwhile, Pepperdine continues to have really solid individual results in the tournament. So, um, you know, I don't think there was any movement change in terms of the order, Texas, Texas, Pepperdine, North Carolina, but I always, I mean, these first place votes are going to be funny to watch moving forward. Um, that was my big takeaway is just who, who makes that, that votes. Uh, we didn't have as many dual matches on the women's side. So there really wasn't much fluctuation in these rankings um, at all. Really. The, the Pepperdine over Texas, it's respect for Texas returning national champions, four of the core five coming back this off sure. season. You can understand that. But, like, if you, you'll listen to our Pepperdine podcast, I think we disagree. Shout out to the school that's like, you know, I, 
North Carolina is still number one. Like, I, I would like to hear the reasoning for why they have them at number one. It is interesting to see, again, NC State Cal, their late additions, very much reflected in this top 10 poll. And we talked about that before. But, you know, now we've got a top 10 matchup uh, this weekend with Pepperdine taking on Cal. And that's something we'll talk about in a little bit as well. It's nice to see Oklahoma rewarded for their win over Princeton. I believe they moved up a bit into that top 20, number 18 here uh, when this poll came out. I think they were rewarded. Did this come out before it? After it? Maybe I'm a little off here. I feel like it came out right after it. Anyway, Jay's giving me a face is why I bring this up. Well, uh, they were, uh, they didn't move, right? They moved up one spot. Like they were 19 prior. They're 18 now. Yeah, but that said, like, again, I think there's a pretty, I mean, Florida State, we we can talk about, um, but, you know, Michigan, Texas A&M, Georgia Tech, eh, maybe. Um, but like the teams above them are still very, very good. I don't know if we're ready to consider Oklahoma in that top 16 caliber quite yet. That said, that they continue to inch closer and hold, I think, a, a reaffirmation of that. And the fact that Princeton held despite the loss, I think also a reaffirmation of how talented that team may be. Chris, thoughts? Yeah, I'm thinking the Oklahoma move up. I I think was just off the Baylor drop, if I'm not mistaken. I think they dropped to 19 and everybody in front of them. But yeah, on the on the women's side, it was pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much chalk if you compare them week to week. And I don't have the two weeks in front of me. They they were almost identical. Very very little change on on that side. So like you said, th- this weekend we'll get some more matches. We just need some matches on the women's side to of substance to uh to you know, to have some more interesting talks about you know the rankings but yeah I, i'm with jay on the on the whole pepperdine texas and uh, and even you alex on the uh, how, how do you put north carolina one i uh, okay sure yeah no i like it well then with that in mind let's talk about the meat on the bone for the rankings moving forward the matches that are going to be played across the country this weekend let's you know what i, I i'm not even going to pick the start Jay, you can talk about a match maybe that happened this week already. You can talk about what you wrote about on the No Ad, No uh, No Problem blog, which, of course, readers should go, uh, listeners should go read. There it is. That's the phrasing because, of course, you have already written about your matches of the week. Talk to me about that piece. Talk to me about what you're watching most closely. Yeah, I mean, I think we just talked about this a little bit with Oklahoma win over Princeton, right? Um, That was one I was watching this week that happened on Tuesday. Uh, Pepperdine, I mean, Princeton made their Oklahoma swing. They played both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Uh, They lost both of those matches. Uh, I think a few things to note, Princeton pulled both Zoe Howard and um, Vicki Hugh from their match against Oklahoma State. They played against Oklahoma, but so can't put too much stock into that win, but still a good win from Oklahoma State, who's fielding pretty impressive roster, I would say. Um, I mean, how about the Oklahoma-Princeton match? Comes down to three all. Carmen Corley versus number four in, in the country, Daria Freeman, gets the upset at home. Uh, really good win for them. That will bode kind of give them good confidence moving forward, particularly if in fact, Dana Guzman is out for an extended period of time, she was going to play top of the lineup. So that was uh, a really interesting swing. I had my eye on um, and it was good to see kind of the Oklahoma teams prevail there. Well, you talk about Corley. She had a really good uh, season last year. One of those, again, less heralded top performances because Oklahoma was good. They weren't exceptional last year the way they have the chance to be in the mix for hosting a regional at the NCAA this season. That Durham regional, Duke, Oklahoma, Furman, Nebraska, it's fascinating because the Blue Devils, again, we talked about their performance at the Michigan Invitational on our Pepperdine podcast, but... They weren't exceptional. Like, you know, Chloe Beck suffered a loss that weekend. And, you know, that team was so reliant on their top three last season. Will they be relying again on that Chen Drummy Beck trio this year? Oklahoma's got a top three and in particular, you know, a number one in Corley who you feel, they feel pretty good about their top three. They feel pretty good even with the injury to Guzman about all of these flights. And so in particular, though, back of the lineup, four, five, six for Oklahoma against an unproven Duke team. It's that kickoff, that region got a lot more interesting. It did. I would actually say Oklahoma's strength is at four, five, and six over their one, two, and three, which can compete, particularly with Guzman scheduled to be in the lineup. That was kind of my big question of how does Princeton's depth compare against Oklahoma? Um, 
Oklahoma is really strong at four, five, and six, even without Guzman. And you're right. That's the vulnerability of Duke, right? It's an untested four, five, and six. So it's a, a good match calculus, if you will, for, um, for Oklahoma to potentially pull off a victory. I should have said I meant experience. They are very experienced at the top of the lineup, so they won't yeah. feel at a deficit up there. But you're right. It's that depth against an unproven Duke team. And so that was a big win from Oklahoma. But all right, with that in mind, though, talk to me about the week ahead. What are you watching most closely for, Jay? Well, so you can read about it on the blog. Um, so the two matches that I chose, and I'll explain it because we just have, a, especially on the women's side, this weekend is really um, an all-star weekend. Uh on the women's side, I picked NC State playing Ohio State. So there's a good kind of southeastern matches. So can I just ask why did you pick that over Duke? Because Ohio State's at Duke as well. Ohio State's at Duke as well. So there are a few reasons, and you can read about yeah. these on the blog. Um, but it ultimately came down to I'm going to try and showcase as many teams as I can on the matches of the week. And when I think about a team like Duke, Pepperdine, UNC, Georgia, they think there are going to be a lot of matches of the week that they're participating in. Um, So a non-conference match between NC State and Ohio State was interesting to me. And I have a lot of questions about both of those teams. Yes, there it is. Yep, And so, right, like what's in, this isn't just, hey, these are the top matches of the week. This is, these are the intriguing ones, right, that will tell, uh, I have questions on that will tell us a lot. And both of these teams are, are, are ripe with questions. Yeah. Now, let's be clear. I mean, Cal Pepperdine, oh, Georgia, North Carolina, you'll get there. Like, yeah. that's the well, thing. I mean, those are really good. I'm guaranteed to get there with Cal Pepperdine because they have another match already scheduled. Yeah. You want to just save that one. But if you want to do a separate, you know, you could do matches of the week. Oh, I guess you got a real job. So maybe you can't do matches of the week. But well, I do. I do one men, one women. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm saying, you know, both sides. It, it, there's the point is it's a gauntlet, and yeah. that, it's interesting to hear your reasoning because again, Duke is unproven at the bottom of their lineup, but I think we have a pretty good idea of who those players are going to be, and we talked about that in our preview podcast. It will be interesting to see what Ohio State does, where Boulay is, where you know Coley Allen is in the lineup if she's in the lineup, what they do across the board because obviously that's another team where their depth was the pride of their lineup last season, and so how they go about replacing that or you know adjusting that will be fast. Fascinating. But yeah, you mentioned it on the women's side and just across the board, whether it be and just for our listeners who want to know Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time, Ohio State at Duke. You can find all of the links, by the way, on Chris's website, collegetennisranks.com as well. Just click on the week ahead tab. You also on Friday have Tennessee, Oklahoma, Cal, uh, Virginia and UCLA as top 25 teams in action you know, there's other good, you know, I think Kentucky at Notre Dame on the women's side, pretty interesting on Friday as well. A couple of other ones across the board, Missouri at Iowa. What does Iowa look like if Alexa Noel is having ankle surgery? That's something to watch for. Saturday is just an embarrassment of riches. 11 a.m. Eastern time, Georgia at North Carolina. This, You know what's so difficult is, well, I'll get to it in a second. Georgia, uh, teaser in the business, folks. G- uh, Georgia at North Carolina. It says 11 a.m. or noon. It's going to be one of those two times, apparently, listed twice. That's how good it is. It's listed twice right now on Chris's website. Um, I Prince- love the IPA site. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Princeton at North Carolina State. That's another noon Eastern time match. 3 p.m. Cal Eastern time taken on Pepperdine. That match in Malibu. Uh, again, you've got USC in action, Texas A&M in action, UCF. What does Georgia Tech look like? I'm very fascinated to find out. And then, of course, we get to Sunday. Princeton at Duke. Ohio State at NC State. Florida State, Tennessee, Auburn, all in action as well. NC State in play. I mean, it's it's a jam-packed weekend on the women's side. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, un- unfortunately, even though it shows twice there because somebody uh, probably got both schools putting in it at different times on the ITA site, I think that Georgia-North Carolina match has been postponed. Uh, oh, no. So oh, Really? Double breaking news. Quinn redshirted this postponed. Where's Parsa? Are you in the background? Come on. I mean, if I, um, I'm looking at the Georgia women's site and it shows the North Carolina match for Saturday as postponed. Uh, uh, so I don't think that match is actually they, going to take place. But they just tweeted had, about it. 
Yeah, had that been... Westoff, give me the breaking news sound effect. Mid-podcast news, folks. Georgia, North Carolina canceled. Did they give a reasoning, Jay? COVID protocols. Yeah, that makes sense. It checks out. Um, no <laughs> trucks. Yeah, exa- no, but of course, kickoff weekends next weekend. So I promise you, a even if it's just you know a contact trace sort of thing, whatever it may be, these coaches are going to take precautions. But b something again, it's an eerie reminder of what's looming over everything this season. So that is interesting breaking news. I apologize for uh, interrupting you, Chris. Go ahead. No, I was saying so that. So maybe, that by was the way, my, though, good call, Jay. That's, I was that's just like, can we just take sight. a moment to, yeah. to thank my, what, 2,000 words that were chosen wisely on Ohio State. I mean, knock on wood, right? But Ohio State, <laughs> yeah. NC State. Um, yeah, I was call. just sitting there thinking, Jay, how is Ohio State, NC State your match of the week when we have Georgia, North Carolina, and I pull it up, and all of a sudden I see postponed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, how long has that been out well, there? But, we're not, uh, we shouldn't make light of COVID protocols, but at least some good came out of it. So, like, let's go. Yeah, it's, it's a win, yeah. Jay. Shout out to you. Well, hopefully everybody – yeah, I mean, the, obviously, hopefully we're, we we want everybody to be uh, full strength and healthy for, for the kickoff weekend so that we've got the best schools at the uh, – at the indoors when those happen. But, but yeah, so be, given that that match is uh, now looks like it's not taking place. Yeah. I'm, I'm with Jay. I'll, I'll look for the, uh, for the NC state, Ohio state match. Yeah. It, it should be a, a very fun weekend of action on the women's side. And again, speaking of a team with unknowns, Cal, what is their lineup going to look like? A lot of talented additions. Katya Weir's home, a late add to that team as well. Certainly she'll be in the mix, but you know, Giovara returning at top as well. And that team's got some depth, plenty of returns. I believe their only loss from last season was Anna Bright. Yeah, it, it, watch out for this Cal team, folks. And look, with Pepperdine, I'm sure Pear has text. I know he's, I, never mind, sorry. Sorry, Pear, that one slipped out. Leave it in, Westoff. Let's just say I'm sure he's wondering what others think of his lineup. Um, you know, it's an unknown. What, I'm, I'm sure they would be. I'm sure he'll be like Chris. You pick. You know what? You tell me because you want to play Flores at one or six. Like it doesn't matter to me. Where where should Brodus go? Three, four. Like all right, Czar's at one. Fine, it works for me. Like again, a lot of options for Pepperdine. I just want to see the choice. You know, now they're forced to make a choice, and so I'm very very excited to see what that decision is. With that in mind, let's flip gears. Talk about the men, Chris. Start with you. Give me the matches you're watching most closely this week. I mean, it has to be the combination of, you know, of which there's, they play each other as well, of the the Arizona and Pepperdine weekends, if you will, right? I mean, Arizona's got Texas and Pepperdine. Pepperdine's got Stanford and Arizona. Those, you know, those matches to me are, uh, are the big ones for the weekend, I will, I'll give a couple shout outs for some, some outsider matches. I don't expect much from the UCF Florida match. Okay. UCF, maybe they're going to jump up and surprise us. I don't expect it. The one I'm really a little more interested to see how it goes is Harvard. Harvard at Virginia. We saw Virginia today. Virginia looked great. They played Liberty Liberty, no slouch. Okay. I mean, they finished 39 last year. They've got some good players. I didn't expect more than one or two really competitive matches in there. They got a good three setter at the top of the lineup, but Virginia looked good bar. You know, I, I was, I was expecting a grind in that bar match bar looked really good to me. Never really challenged that. I was watching him specifically to see kind of, you know, a, what kind of shape is he in was hoping to get pushed a little to see, If he had it, but it was almost like he was sort of toying with Rafa and like, hey, when I need it, I'll I'll hit it. And other than that, I'm just going to make you hit a lot of balls. Um, And and he had the shape to do it. So so Virginia looked really good to me. Harvard is that team that, you know, obviously nobody saw any Ivy League last year. They're they're more so than Columbia, which is usually the, the, the top, you know, in the past recent years, the top touted Ivy league team, Harvard seems to be that team this year. Yeah. As Gruskin, you know, sh- gives us a shout out to the Columbia that's on his chest right now. Uh, Harvard's get, getting a lot of that press this year. So it's going to be our first good look at them. I'm, I am looking forward to that match. Not so much from the Virginia standpoint. I think I saw enough of, of Virginia today to know 
what we're going to get there. I just want to see where Harvard's at. You know, can we throw them in that mix? They're ranked preseason. Are they worthy of the rank? Do they deserve to be a little higher, a little lower, right where they're at? It'll be a good barometer for what we think of that Harvard team. That's probably, uh, you know, one of my one of my favorite matches of the weekend. And then, you know, well, quickly, I want to stop you there because I want to. So my older brother over holiday vacation and, you know, he's in business school right now. So he's got all the isms working for him. And we'd want to talk about something more and say, well, let's unpack that. I want to unpack that Virginia thing uh, for a little bit there, Chris, because you talk about how they look today. And, you know, I tweeted this out and I think it was a takeaway. All of us were wondering, you know, they've got six, seven, eight guys who they could throw into the singles lineup, feel pretty comfortable about. Um, you know, nine guys, maybe even if you want to include Will Woodall in there as well, what was going to be the six? And we debated it on our podcast. And I believe I suggested that Rodesh could line up at that number one spot. You put the tall guy up top there, indoor tennis. And again, he flashed his upside all fall, tremendously successful and got better and better throughout the course of last season, delivered them some big wins. And he talked to Coach Pedroso. He talked about the growth he saw uh, from Chris on our uh, on our Cracked Interviews podcast. It's funny, I said from Chris and I was like, oh, I must have screwed up the name there. I was like, no, you are talking about Chris Rodesh. It's fine. Um, but, you know, again, Rodesh one, Montez two. Not von der Schulenberg, yeah. not B- Botzer, Montez at two, of course, Botzer three. And then the shock, I think the most shocking thing was to see Jeffrey von der Schulenberg outside the top three. We felt like he would be a lock in there. And let's be clear, you've got a guy in Botzer who's proven he can do it. And so he was always going to be in the mix. And I do think it's worth noting, Getz five, Gianni Ross six, no uh, Jackson Allen today, period. No uh, no Alex Kiefer today either. Jay, it's your school. We'll go to you first. Your thoughts on this lineup? Yeah, well, it was a shock to see Doc Vaughn at four only because it broke up the trio of sophomores, right? I feel like the permutation of the lineups. Well, right, I was like, okay, bar's going to be one or four. Can but I like, be honest? You, I'm not saying this is true, but Andreas Pedroso doing that may have convinced me to not have Matt on tonight's podcast. I was like, oh, it can be done. Like, we can break up trios. <laughs> and so up. I'm not saying that's true, but it might be. Yeah, well, that's a good analogy. Yeah, <laughs> that was like, wait, th- th- that's not <laughs> that's not how it's done, right? These yeah. three, like, move up or down together. Um, so that was a big surprise. Um but he hasn't had a great fall. And whereas Montez has been playing really well, Rodesh has had a really good summer and fall. So uh, not super surprising, I guess, if it's just based on results, obviously slot and bar in there makes sense. Um, one note on Harvard though, I would, they did not have Henry von der Schulenberg, Jeffrey's brother in their match against Boston college. So I think that changes the tenor of the Virginia match. If he's out of the lineup, um, it's a much kind of more competitive match with him in it. So I do hope we see that with his younger brother at four, they probably won't stack up against each other, which would have been fun. But um, yeah, just that one note on Harvard. But overall, I thought UVA looked looked strong as you would expect. I'm in early season form. So the conspiracy theories are flying. Is that why Coach Pedroso did it? So it's like, hey, Jeffrey, you don't want to play your brother, right? All right, I'll start you at four. Is that cool? And it's like, yeah, okay, because he's definitely not going to be there. So, yeah, play me at four, (laughs) Coach. Like, that's not a horrible conspiracy theory, Jay. Chris, your reaction? Well, you know, when you tweeted that out earlier today. Did you scream at your computer? Well, no, but I what what I wanted to do was I wanted to go back and listen to our pod. Um because I feel like the lineup they played was really close to what I said it would be. Yeah. Uh, I said Rodesh one indoors. I think I put Montez two. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I went Botzer, Von der Schulenberg, or Von der Schulenberg, Botzer, but I, as, just as Jay said, I called out, hey, Von der Schulenberg didn't have a great fall. So I could have easily, whether I said it or not, I could have seen that three, four being swapped either way. And then the Getz Gianni five, six seemed like a given to me. So that's that's pretty much what what I was expecting to see. Um, And I think, you know, I think when they play, obviously, some of some teams that they kind of know going in, they're going to win. We're going to see Jack, you know, Jackson Allen and Alex Kiefer and others are definitely going to get some PT. But, you know, no, there's no sense in taking a, a needless chance your first match of the year, not knowing 
what your guys are going to bring or what the other guys are going to bring. You're going to play the lineup that you think gives you the best chance to win. So, yeah, I think that was kind of what I expected to see uh, out of UVA. Yeah, no, one of my favorite lines of the coaching interview series is when I was asking Coach Pedrosa about his team and I asked him about Inyaki and he goes, well, he's just so Spanish. And I was saying, he said it in a lot. I was like, that's a great, and it's like, again, from a game style perspective, six feet behind the baseline, right? And just tracking everything down. Do you want that at two or do you want that at four? And to see that choice be, well, for now, he should be at two. That's how well he's playing. Certainly had a great Charlottesville challenger as we discussed in our podcast about Virginia, but As you mentioned, that is just one of the many fascinating matches, fascinating lineup decisions to monitor over the course of the weekend. And yeah, as you mentioned, let's just run through the schedule quickly. Friday, Texas at Arizona. Texas looking to bounce back. Will Waldy be in the lineup? Will Spaziri be in the lineup? He played against Florida. That's a home match, kickoff of the year. I'm sure he looked at Bruce Burke and said, I am playing. Like, this isn't a question. And he grinded out the victory against Riffis. Now, it's probably going to be Strom against Arizona. That's another grind for Spaziri. Couldn't really hit backhands. Fascinating match there. Boy, would it help the the Wildcats to get an early win over a Texas team that's going to see Baylor, see TCU, a bunch. That would be great for Arizona moving forward. At home, first match of the season, seriously, for the Wildcats. Come on now. That's a very, very fun one. Of course, top 25 teams in action. Harvard taking on number one preseason team, Virginia Tech. Uh, Ole Miss taking on Oklahoma State. Do you guys like how I slipped that in there? No one? No reaction to my Virginia Tech? Chris, like I've heard it so many days now. Um, no, Oklahoma State versus Ole Miss is fascinating because what does Oklahoma State look like? And so, Cancel. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, well, but we but we did get a look at Oklahoma State, right? They did. played Arkansas. Arkansas beat them five uh, two. I, I think I think that was the final, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no good win for for an Arkansas team. Uh, honestly, was expecting probably a little more challenge uh, from Oklahoma State. Granted, it's I mean it feels like a completely hundred percent bread it's almost like a startup team right like you start up it's like a dot it's a dot com they should just be oklahoma state.com or something it's a startup but uh but yeah that's uh i i think i expected a little more arkansas did what they needed to do and they and they took it to them see you call them a startup team on the streets they're called baylor's b team um, don't worry, Westoff's crack. <laughs> Westoff is one thousand percent quacking that joke. I swear to God, Westoff, if I hear anything from the people that you didn't quack that out, I'm gonna be upset because that was very mean. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, no, that's Friday, and of course, top ten teams and uh, twenty five teams, excuse me, USC doubleheader, Kentucky. What lineup choices are they making? Fascinated to find out. South Carolina playing twice as well. Michigan also in action. Some interesting, you know, we always get yelled at uh, about talking, you know, the Power 5 focus. I would say, and this is Power 5 adjacent, but, you know, Cornell in action. All of these Ivy League teams that we haven't seen compete in a season and a half. I'm fascinated to see what they all look like. San Diego, UC Irvine. Let's see if San Diego's ap- able to capitalize on what was certainly a, a huge fall uh, for their program. You know, those are all interesting ones. And then we move on to Saturday, as Chris referred to. UCF at Florida. Ohio State at Illinois, where your boy will be back on the call. For that match, that one I was also worried was going to get canceled. In the end, they're going to play it. Now, I do think there may be some absences, but we play ball, folks. Ohio State at Illinois, noon Eastern time on Saturday. Yeah, I'm excited for that matchup. Of course, you've got Kentucky in a doubleheader action uh, on Saturday as well. Oklahoma uh, playing that day. Also, plenty of fun. Also, you know, non-top 25 action in the works. I'll let Chris J get to that in a second. Sunday, want to run through final one. Tennessee back in action there at home against Tennessee Tech. You've got Texas at Arizona State, the aforementioned Harvard at Virginia, USC, South Carolina, Mississippi State, Mississippi State at Middle Tennessee State. I know that's one Chris has his eye on for sure. Doubleheader for Oklahoma that day as well. I do want to mention the Tuesday Wake Forest at Tennessee. We may podcast again before that matchup, but, you know, again, so many questions about this Wake Forest team. It's going to be interesting to see what they choose to do against Tennessee. All of those matches in mind, I know that's a lot for you listeners to process. A reminder, you can find them all listed out, collegetennisranks.com, week ahead tab. Jay, 
your thoughts on everything. Well, uh, on the Tennessee Wake Forest match, you can read more about those questions on my <laughs> blog. Um, they were originally a weekend match. They got moved to Tuesday. So I'm glad they're still playing and still kind of within the, the week threshold. Um, but yeah, we saw a Karamov in action for the first time after five matches at Wake Forest. So he comes in top 500 ATP guy, many a years on the tour. Um, so is that a replacement for Squire? Does he play one? Uh, that will be really interesting to see for that Wake team. I think it's a sneaky good match. Uh, Wake, obviously, every year has a ton of depth. If Tennessee rolls out the same lineup, do we see the same sort of performances from Angel Diaz uh, and can't, uh, Connor Gannon? That's a question. So I think that's a sneaky good one. Uh, I plan on being live in person tomorrow at the Stanford Pepperdine match. Um, so that should be good. I have that on upset alert, given just the questions that we have about Stanford. Axel Geller playing his first match uh, at the Sherwood Cup. Pepperdine's looked really good this fall. Five guys in the top 100. They can certainly play. So that's another interesting one. Um, well, I'm glad you bring that up because I'm sure. Oh, I don't. I'm not sure he's listening, but it may be brought to his attention that. I did not mention the Pepperdine weekend at Stanford on Friday, Arizona home on Sunday. That's because they're not on the website yet, Chris. This is your fault. It's entirely your fault. And I you know I just wanted to bring that up as a joke, of course. I know they're getting on the website momentarily. And again, collegetensranks.com, week ahead tab. That's called the built-in promo there for you, Chris. That is a fascinating weekend. I think this Pepperdine team's really good, Chris. I think, again... That Rodgers had the fall that he did, that he looks like a uh, not, I want viable is too rude to say, but that he looks like he can be a successful option in the top two with him and DeJong. And then all of the options they have moving down the lineup three through six, this team will scrap. Like this team is in the mix for a top 16 seed come NCAAs. Yeah, I mean, Definitely. They, they've added some depth. They bring guys back. It's a good team. Uh, I think it's it, it's very that's why, why I said up top, you know, between Pepperdine and, and Arizona for the weekends between the two of them. I'm very excited to see what they had. I, and I will say you brought up an interesting match that probably, you know, if, if you're looking for those, hey, what are the not major top 25 schools that give I me the rundown i was gonna say on those and by the way the the final thought i would have pepperdine if they can win one of these matches arizona or stanford boy would that help their top 16 case particularly a win like over arizona who you feel like immensely that, yeah i mean they yeah. need frankly because of what they have conference in, in the conference and the the limited opportunities they have they need to win one of those well, if they want to be. Let me ask you this. If they go one and two, because I want just to finish the Pepperdine thought and then the floor is yours. I want you to tell me about the the less heralded matches of the weekend, but are still going to be fantastic. But if Pepperdine just wins one of Stanford, Arizona, or USC on the kickoff weekend, just one of them, is that enough? Like is one and two the goal or do they need to be two and one to really lock in that 16 seed moving forward? I mean, I, I honestly, I doubt that one of those is, I mean, without something else during the season, the just one on its, on its own won't be enough, but going 0 and three in those is going to be brutal to trying to get a, a, a top 16 uh, types ranking by the end of the year, given that, you know, they're not playing in the PAC 12 and they don't get an opportunity to play Stanford Arizona, USC, UCLA. Oregon, now, you know. I will point out, though, they have USC and UCLA back-to-back -back Friday, Saturday, end of February. They've got Harvard on, right. the, on the schedule. They've got Texas on the schedule as well. In those yeah. six matches, three wins? Like, is three and three the number? Two and two? Uh, two and four? Like, oh, that's the question, really. Oh, probably two of those. I mean, uh, if, yeah. if you're talking those schools— if yeah. you win two of those matches, yeah, you're probably top 16. Uh, you know, yeah. I think two of those matches is enough to to get them into the top 16. I agree. I think that's the number. If they can get two and to get one of them at home early in the season, that Arizona match is fascinating. Because talk about, again, that's that's 12 scrappers on the court. Like, oh my, that match, five hours, lock it in, no ad scoring, simultaneous start. It doesn't matter. It's going the distance. Um, Jay, uh, well, oh, sorry, Chris. I interrupted you. I apologize. Other matches you have your eyes on. Yeah, I mean, you you had called a couple out. So one of the ones I think that's really interesting that's probably not getting very little press because neither team is ranked is going to be 
the UC Irvine San Diego match, right? San Diego is a really good team, uh, bringing back some some good guys. And UC Irvine is a team that I, you know, I talked about a little earlier uh, over the I don't somewhere over the winter break that got a couple transfers in Emmanuel Costa from Oregon and Ricardo Roberto from Alabama that, you know, that makes them a dangerous team. So seeing uh, that UC Irvine team with San Diego, it's, it's, it's interesting at a minimum. Uh, And then middle Tennessee, again, you pointed out with my Mississippi state team, but middle Tennessee, a lot of success against sec teams last year, uh, Mississippi State was not one of the teams they managed to beat. They did get wins, I think, at Ole Miss and Vandy and, you know, and more than that. They had three or four wins in the SEC. That That's a very interesting matchup uh, this weekend as well with Middle Tennessee uh, taking on Mississippi State. Can I throw a couple more at you? You tell me interesting or not, Chris? Sure. Memphis at Notre Dame. NCAA implications. Like if we're talking 46, 47. Yeah, you may be not, not overly interesting to me. Okay, That's fair. No, again, this is why I'm asking. Cause I want the full, I want the full take here. No, uh, unfiltered here. I am interested to see Cal just compete once again, North Florida at Miami. I mean, Miami should take care of business without question there. North Florida, a little bit dangerous, but a little out of their league down at Miami. Okay. No, again, these are all interesting. Texas Tech at SMU. Uh, in that's what I of was going to bring up. Yeah, yeah NCAA. I feel like that's a huge one. Sorry, yeah, Jay. I didn't yeah, mean to for you sure NCAA way. implications there, right? I mean, SMU with the standard uh, 37-man roster uh, and uh, and Texas Tech, you know, figuring out what they've got. Yeah, that Texas Tech team is, you know, should be an NCAA team no matter what. And SMU with a chance to show that 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 they belong in there as well. Uh, it's a that's a definitely probably a bigger match for SMU than it is for Texas Tech. Jay. Yeah, that was going to be my, my question. I think the, the SMU team has reloaded with a lot of new guys this year. And I know they were a bubble team, feels like, last few years. Um, and Texas Tech will have a lot more opportunities, right, to get some of these wins. Um, so that feels like a really big one for SMU. And I think they get them at home, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And to- no, and one other one I would throw out there, Oklahoma State at Alabama. That's an interesting one, I think, inherently as well. So just something to keep your eye on. I believe that's Saturday, 7 p.m., although what I'm learning is every match we've brought up probably canceled. So that's I was going to say, it might have been their whole weekend. Yeah, no. I know uh, the Mississippi one was canceled. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know it, it may have been that whole weekend. Um, all right, with all that said, again, as we filter through, any storylines, lineup things in particular we haven't mentioned, Jay, that you're watching for? I'm super curious to see who plays two and three for USC. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Stefan Dostin, it's right. Going to be a lock at one, but I mean, just pick your guy at two and three and, you know, you feel pretty good about who they can field at four five and six, but I have no idea who plays two. Uh, and that's going to be a big question that I'm watching. I hope yeah. we see their full lineup, um, this weekend. I, so I hope we just see full lineups in general. Like, again, as all of these yep. teams prepare for the kickoff weekend, they're going to, you know, take the reserved route most likely. But a lot of teams were seen for the first time. What are those lineups going to look like? We'll find out. Chris, final thoughts go to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested to see as well what, what we're going to get out of uh, out of Oklahoma State. The, the, the Oklahoma State-Alabama match is canceled, by the way. But, I mean, I, I meant out of USC – the USC just with the new guys coming in, uh, that's yeah, and and not having seen them yet, that that will be interesting. Uh, but to your point, Alex, yeah, it's it's going to be one of the it's day by day matches are going to be canceled, or we you know we're we're heading back into that era again of of seeing a lot of canceled matches. So hopefully we get some just postponements, and they still get to play them later in the year or at some point. But it's tough to find dates for a lot of these schools, so. Uh, you know, it a lot of that may depend on how important that match is. If it's a, you know, cupcake match, probably not going to get rescheduled. A match that means something to one of the teams uh, based on the points that could be get garnered, 
maybe that one gets rescheduled if possible. But yeah, it's unfortunate, but but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, all of these matches, hopefully we get to see. We're celebrating the return of college tennis. We understand safety, health, priority for the East student athletes, of course, for everyone involved. Hopefully we get to see a lot of good college tennis over the course of the weekend. I need an Ohio State-Illinois take from both of you since I'm going to be on the call. Here's the thing. Give me the Ohio State. So this was going to be my last kernel. Cannon Kingsley lost his match against Xavier yesterday, and that was unexpected to say the least. Now it's one match. No ad scoring early in the season. But like against Illinois— do we see a, you know, there was no Tracy in the lineup last time. And that felt notable to me that we didn't see Tracy. I believe we saw Luching, uh, Lutching, I'm butchering the pronunciation. Andrew played Chris. He was six in that lineup uh, yesterday. So we got to see him in the singles lineup. But, you know, again, is it Cannon? Is it, you know, Kingsley, Votzel, Tracy? Is it, you know, Kingsley, Votzel, Trotter, Tracy? Where does Van Emberg fit into the mix? Who do they play at six? Is Anthrop now a surprise? Jay's sources confirm redshirt as well. All these different things. I'm fascinated about Jay. Start with you. Give me an Illinois, Ohio State. By the way, Illinois, Kovacevic, Zeke, Cliff, core of last year's team, all gone, but they bring in a ton of talent as well to replace it. Are they top 16 good? Are they, oh my God, we just beat Ohio State at home to kick off the season, kind of like last year's national indoors event good. A lot of intrigue around this match. We didn't even get to hype it up. Yeah, it wouldn't be Ty Tucker if he didn't play Cannon Kingsley at one, Votzel at two, and then play Votzel at one, Cannon Kingsley at so, one. So this same is, day. is is Kingsley playing five this weekend now? Like, is that the justification? It's like, well, he lost. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't, thought. Can't move him more than one spot. <laughs> That's a good call. Um, I mean, yeah, you thought uh, Jeffrey von der Schulenberg was playing four to boy's brother. Uh, how about maybe Kingsley, Kingsley taking a, a strategic loss early in the season? Um, I, I don't know who plays one. I mean, I would probably go Votzel. Uh, he's had a good fall. Uh, play Kingsley too. I think this, the bigger surprise for me was Van Emberg playing above mm-hmm. uh, Trotter. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it doesn't, it tracks based on just like general results, but I thought Van Emberg would be like a five for them and just dominate down there. Um I, I, should we be concerned that Tracy wasn't in the lineup? I, I, I don't know. Um, but you would think it would be Cannon Kingsley, Botzel at, at the top two in whatever order. Apparently Tracy and Van Emberg and then Trotter and whoever they want to throw at six. Yeah, no. Ton of options, obviously, for the Buckeyes. Chris, actually this time, final word to you. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, first of all, all I have to say is, hey, losing to a 12-3 is not going to help Cannon Kingsley's UTR. Uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not surprised. I'm not overly surprised to see Van Emberg play in three. I mean, the he's he's not a grinder that you want to throw down at four or five. I mean, he hits big. Um, so and, you know, he hasn't been around long enough to get in the doghouse of Ty like James Trotter has. <laughs> so, so, so maybe that just needs a little time to be able to work it, you know, before he can work himself down. But, but yeah, let's, let's Sean getting to play at six. Uh, but I still think we see, you know, in the matches that matter, I, I think we're going to see Tracy. I think we see Tracy at three. Uh, but, uh, but it could be Van Emberg three, Tracy four. I think we see, those two in the in the three four spot probably Trotter five. I also don't know you know uh, the the cash deal. I don't know if uh, you know. I kind of expect to see Robbie playing. So um, in, in my mind, that's that's six. So so we'll see. I from a call perspective, I don't see how you get away from no matter what lineup they throw out there with everything that Illinois lost last year. Ohio State's got to be the favorite. So. Uh, I mean, that, that's that got to be the expectation coming out of the weekend. See, if you listeners want to know why do these mini break podcasts not be so mini, it's because I know the longer I go, the more likely I am to get something silly out of Chris. And he's talking about cash deals when it comes to Ohio State. And he's talking about, you know, who's in Ty Tucker's doghouse. Do you want to tell the Barbotzer joke you said before the podcast as well, Chris? You want to keep that private too? <laughs> 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 oh, but okay. With all of that said, there's a rundown 
for this weekend's college tennis action. And look, we got a busy week next week, college tennis fans. ITA kickoff preview show. Jay's going to be joining me for the women. I imagine we'll be back, Matt and Chris, for the men as we prepare for the official ceremonial opening weekend of the 2022 college tennis season. But we hope this helped set the scene for all of you. Of course, if you want to hear more about so many of these teams, head on over to our website, crackrackets.com. You can check out our college contender series where we break down our top 10 preseason teams. You can hear from countless Power 5 coaches there as well. Of course, if you want to catch out all that content, like, rate, subscribe, review to this show, Great Shot Podcast, Correct Interviews Podcast, our YouTube channel to ensure that you don't miss out on anything. If you need the more immediate updates, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, we are at Crack Rackets. You want to message me directly, I'm at Great Shot Pod. A shout out as always to our super producer, Daniel Westoff, for the <laughs> of an editing job he does day in, day out. A shout out as well to our friends at Tennis Point, latest and greatest equipment, all in one location, Tennis Dash. Point.com. Use that promo code CR15 to let them know we sent you there. With all that said, for my fantastic guests, Jay and Chris, our super producers, Fliegner and Westoff, our friends at Tennis Point, and all of us here at both Cracked Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, let's see if Chris remembers what do we tell our listeners, guys? That's the break. And we will see you all next time. Thank you, gentlemen.